This week on Dialogue, a discussion on political leadership in Africa with a former head of state. Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. I'm John Molesky. Each week, Dialogue explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. Our guests this week are Festus Mokai and Steve McDonald. Festus Mokai is a former president of the Republic of Botswana and a Wilson Center public policy scholar. He leads the organization Champions for an HIV-Free Generation in Africa and chairs the Council of Elders. Stephen McDonald is consulting director of the Wilson Center's Africa program and of the Project on Leadership and Building State Capacity. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Good to be here. Steve, before we, we dive into the subject matter, could you uh, give us a briefing on the Africa project, our program here at the Center that you direct? Oh, more than happy to, John. Thank you. Uh, and, and obviously, it's, uh, it's an important issue because uh, President Mohai is here uh, in uh, conjunction with our invitation and, and the invitation of the center. Uh, we run a plethora of activities trying to better engage and inform the policymaking community on Africa here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. And that's uh, through a variety of, uh, of events, public policy outreach, scholars and fellows that we bring to the center, uh, publications that we do, number of research projects we're involved in. Uh, we also have, rather uniquely for the center, a, 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 a trio of uh, post-conflict, conflict resolution, mm -hmm. peace-building projects that we're conducting in Burundi, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Liberia, um, where we're working with a diverse group of leaders there to try to help in those democratic transitions. And you say different for the center because often it's just scholarship from afar. Mm -hmm. You're on the ground actually engaged. Yeah, we have a, uh, an on-the-ground uh, practitioner role. Uh, that is unique for the center, where we, we actually are conducting workshops and working uh, closely with the, the leadership of those countries, but, uh, but uh, based out of the center here. Now, not all of your fellows and scholars are former heads of state. Um, How did you score this one? <laughs> it was difficult, I might say. Uh, it took a long time because this is a very busy man. Uh, we had approached him, I, I believe, uh, uh, three or four years ago mm -hmm. about the possibility of coming here, and he wanted to, it agreed in principle, uh, but his duties... Uh, as former head of state uh, with the United Nations as a global envoy on, on uh, the environment and, uh, and a number of other duties that kept him from us until this year. Yeah. Well, we're glad that you were finally able to join us. Uh, President Mikhail, let me ask you a question. Uh, Steve provided me an article written by one of the other scholars. Yes. And, and it, it talks about the Mo Ibrahim Foundation for Governance announcing for the second year in a row that there would be no good governance in Africa Prize. Yes. Uh, what does this say about the current state of, of leadership on the continent? Well, perhaps not much in the, sh in the short term, in the sense that presidents don't retire every year. And so there was no president retiring last year. Uh, there wasn't any who retired this year. So that the fact that there is or no winner does not necessarily mean there are no more qualifying people. Or there may well be retiring presidents who don't necessarily qualify. Uh, so it's too early to come to any definitive conclusion. Now, is that a diplomatic answer? Or is, uh, I'm trying to get a sense of how you would measure the effectiveness of leadership across the board. I know generalizations are difficult. Generalizations are, are, are difficult, but also it's no secret that uh, many of Africa's problems are also related to lack of proper leadership or inappropriate leadership, where uh, leaders, some good, effective leaders, have gone to stay too long, um, overstated their welcome, began to lose their vision, and began to betray their mission. So that, that, that is a problem. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, I'm I, not saying that there is a suffit of, of, of good leaders, but there are 
good leaders. I probably should mention also to our viewers that you are a former winner of the award that I just brought up as well. Okay. <laughs> I think that's important for them to know. Let's, gentlemen, if I can ask you to put your heads together on defining w what political leadership is in the context of this notion of good governance. That's what we're talking about essentially, mm -hmm. political yeah. govern, uh, governing leadership. And I'd ask both of you to uh, help build a, a definition. What are we talking about? What are the attributes? What are the practices? Well, all leadership, political or otherwise, entails somebody having a vision or envisaging something and then going about to motivate and encourage others to work with him to bring, to realize that, uh, that vision. That, that's, that's what it all starts with a vision. Yes, it starts with a vision. And I think leadership, uh, whether again political or otherwise, also uh, depends upon um, the, the um, how should we say the uh, the ability of the leader uh, and and the um, sensibility of the leader uh, to understand the aspirations uh, and needs of uh, of those they lead. In the case of a president of a country, obviously that is uh, his uh, his population. That he's got to be responsive to that population. He's got to listen, he's got to understand. I should, we should say him or her because there is an African right. president who is a woman. Uh, uh, that, uh, uh, and, and, and take into account uh, those aspects. I think one of the failures of leadership in Africa that the president referred to a moment ago, when it has happened, and it hasn't happened across the board, that's important to emphasize, mm -hmm. but when it has happened, has been because they've lost sight of, of the needs and aspirations of the people and become a little bit too uh, concerned only about their own aggrandizement and uh, and uh, uh, maintaining power. And not a phenomenon unique to Africa. Not a phenomenon unique it's to political Africa. Leadership. No. Is, Steve, is leadership something a person can learn or are you a born leader? Oh, that's an interesting question because I think there are attributes that you have to be born with to be an effective leader. Uh, charisma, an ability to engage people, and, and, and an ability to relate to, to empathize uh, uh, with, uh, with followers. But I think there's a lot you can learn about leadership. I, I, I do believe that. So the short answer is, is both. <laughs> so at what point in your life, in what point in your, that's right, but at what point in your life did you uh, think I can be a leader or did you feel that you were being recognized as a leader? How early does this manifest? in a person's life? Well, in my case, I started as a civil servant. And uh, in a developing country, also in a small country, you, you get to be exposed to leadership positions, uh, even in an advisory capacity, quite early in your, in, in your career. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you get accustomed to having to make the decisions, uh, difficult decisions, when you are operating in a situation where resources are limited, the needs are, are, are many, and also, let's say, democratic governance uh, itself was is new. Uh, and therefore, I don't know, but of course, even at, at, uh, as a student, I was a I was a student leader, but I did not perceive myself as leader. Mm -hmm. I just happened that I know that I was Secretary General of our Student Union back home. I was Secretary General of our Botswana Overseas Student Union. What I that meant to that uh, I had an inclination to be a leader, I, I don't know. But I, I always felt that I was by a participant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Were, there, were there people that you uh, admired from afar, uh, leaders that you found inspirational, or closer to home, were there mentors that helped you yes, develop? Yes, at home, my own predecessors were my, well, starting with perhaps my school principal. Uh, he was a self-made man who had left school after six years of, of education and then studied on his own and trained as a teacher, as a primary school teacher, and then studied on his own. I, uh, to, uh, all, to, to a master's degree uh, while teaching all the time. So he was a very disciplined man. So I, I admired him as, as a self-made man. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that one of, was one of my heroes and one of my inspirations. But later, the leaders of my country, I, I admired them. I suppose the first of president, of course, was... Uh, 
he was a prestigious man. He was a traditional, he was born as a traditional leader, but uh, was an educated man and very liberal, open-minded person. So I admired him mm -hmm. uh, that way. And he, he really uh, founded the democracy in, in, in our country. So he was my... If I may add to that, it's, it's a very important point because role models in leadership yeah. uh, are really compelling. And, and it, in all due respect and taking nothing away from you, sir, yeah. you did have a tradition of leadership at the uh, presidential level, which was very admirable. Yeah. And, and that, the, that is not a tradition that in some other African countries prevails, right. uh, where we're expecting a democratic leader to emerge where there, is, there has been a, a history of non-democratic rule and military rule and etc. Yeah. What was is there anything that you've learned about leadership uh, that you know now that you wished you'd known back then when you were president? Well, I no, I think by the time uh, I was a leader, I would say I I, I knew enough. And so, although one never knows uh, everything, with hindsight, I don't I think I would have done everything. The same. That's a great thing to be able to say. That's, <laughs> that's, uh, I think I have no regrets. Mm -hmm. and, and beyond the, theor the oh, thing, I'm sorry. Is that in Africa, because we were emerging from uh, colonial rule, mm -hmm. leaders have, have a, a greater opportunity, which unfortunately they they misused, to to influence their country in the direction in which they would have wanted to move, because we are underdeveloped. Governance and democracy are, under, are still underdeveloped, just like our economies. As a result, soon after independence, individuals were often more important than institutions. And it took us too long for us to, to, to develop institutions. And in those countries where the leaders were, had vision, had um, were more patriotic and uh, they were able to to shape the destinies of, of the countries in a way that it won't be possible in future, in a way that is not possible in this country, in developed countries in general. Mm -hmm. But in Africa, uh, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, leaders had the opportunity to lead their countries in, in particular directions. And as I say, unfortunately, many of them are abused or misused or failed to uh, make use of those opportunities to lead the countries towards uh, democratic, uh, open democratic governance, towards good governance. Steve, you, uh, you said, uh, when you answered both, you said mm. that it's possible to learn to be a leader mm. as well. Uh, are there things going on now that are helping Africa develop a young core of leaders for the future? Oh, I think so, both within and, out, and from within and from without the continent, uh, and particularly in this day and age. Uh, by that I mean uh, that uh, certainly there probably is a natural tendency to leadership in an individual, like with President Mohai showing that early on in his student days. Uh, but in this complicated uh, information technology-driven world, mm -hmm. uh, uh, there, there are there. Are are methods and procedures and and uh, 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 and uh, a lot to be learned about how to conduct leadership, uh, how to uh, energize a constituency, how to use staff properly, just you know how to operate as a leader, particularly at a head of state level, obviously. Uh, and and uh, but that but it's not just at a head of state level; it's right across the board institutionally too. Uh, so there are a lot of leadership training programs. There's even a leadership institute that's based in South Africa that is doing some more marvelous work on, on, on this regard. We, I'm sorry, but go ahead. Not Mr. only that, African civil society of today, mm -hmm. it's much more erudite, much more demanding. Mm, I agree. Uh, and as, uh, not to mention the younger people. The young people uh, are exposed to all the influences in the rest of the world. They know what they want. They, have their, they are clear in their aspirations. They, they see no reason why they should have less opportunities than than other young people in, in, in the rest of the world. But civil society also is now becoming more vocal, more assertive, so that mm -hmm. uh, African leaders are increasingly taking notice of uh, 
civil society opinions said uh, well that, that fits a theory of leadership that says you don't have great leaders without great followers and that if you have people who are demanding more and expecting more of leadership it can emerge yeah well, of course you can rise to the challenge mm -hmm. yes yeah, you know, the uh, you know we, it, the tendency from the Western media is to talk about Africa in terms of problems. It's always a, a negative portrait, whether it's HIV/AIDS or or genocide or civil war, it's uh, or, or minerals being exploited by foreigners. It's always a, a very negative. Uh, uh, yes, how, how do you that's, fix that? That's that's uh, Afro pessimism. Afro pessimism. That's what you call it. Yes, uh, a great many people do that, but then. I think it is a, an objective reality that bad things are, new, are news. And right. good, I once, uh, I used to have a dialogue with the, the media in my country and elsewhere in my travels in Africa, even when I was president. I, I queried them. I say, well, you guys, you always dwell on these bad things, but of course you have to report them. But then th this is one sided. Then they said, no, that's because uh, uh, bad news I is news. They said, Mr. President, if you drove from your office, from your residence to your office, everybody knows you do that every day. Why should we report that? But if you hit a child and uh, your car hits a child and the child is killed, then that's news. <laughs> that's what we report. Right. That's an so that's how they explain. Another so uh, maybe, maybe there was a preponderance at mm. some stage of of bad news, so that now when when more and more African countries do the right things, that's not exciting for the media. So they are still looking for where there are coups, where there are rapes, where there are genocides. That's still, of course, the headlines. But the rest of the global audience, therefore, is fed on that. Uh, I don't know whether one should blame anybody, uh, given the explanation I said the, the press gave. So more and more countries have become democratic in Africa. And a great many leaders have emerged, but only political and economic analysts would note that and write about that. But the news media, on uh, the daily news media, they're not interested in long-term trends or medium-term trends. They're interested in uh, dramatic daily events. And that's what they report. Addiction to conflict. Yeah. Uh, well, let's swim against that tide. We have yeah. some time. Here. Yeah. Let's ask both of you, what are some of the good news in terms of leadership? Where are we seeing best practices and positive uh, outcomes and progress? I think there are many African countries, for instance, like my own country. We were among the poorest at independence in 1966. Even before I, I retired, we were rated a, a middle-income middle income country. Uh, Namibia is, is progressing well uh, along democratic lines. South Africa is being seen. Mozambique was involved in a, a long, vicious civil war. But since then, it has become fully democratic, and uh, they have had uh, several peaceful elections um, and, and changes of, 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 of leadership, where there is uh, the vibrant opposition. In most of, 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 of Southern Africa, that's, the, that's happening now. Malawi, Mozambique, Tanzania. Tanzania used to be famous as a one-party state, as our leader in, in one-party state. Mm -hmm. Now it's a multi-party uh, democracy. Uh, so Kenya, before the last elections, was coming up fine. There were, I, I don't say there was perfection, but uh, but the, the situation was evolving, that in this, last, this decade, the first decade of this millennium, Africa has been growing about, in the aggregate, about 4.7, 4 4.7 to 4.9%. That has been reduced by mm -hmm. one percentage point to three point something. 
Uh, whereas the 80s, the African, most African countries either regressed or had zero growth or very marginal growth. Mm -hmm. That's no longer the case. So both on the political front and on the economic front, we are making, uh, we are making progress. L let me add to that because I absolutely agree. And first of all, there are a number of other country cases, and I'll just list them quickly: Ghana, uh, we Mali. Have some time. Let's, let's uh, not brush over the uh, positives well, well, uh, quickly. Well, Benin. Uh, I mean, there are countries that have had repeated democratic elections. In fact, replacing uh, political parties and 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 and, and regimes uh, by peaceful elections. Uh, uh, but also, the economic growth uh, issue that the president mentioned is extremely important. Not only has the rate of growth been quite high by world standards. There are individual countries that are in the 8, 9, 10 percent brackets. This is GNDP growth over the last 10 years. Uh, and uh, of course, business is always very smart. And whereas the general public here in the United States and the West in general probably still looks quite negatively at Africa, I guarantee you that the businessman is out there working very hard in Africa. The opportunities are, are quite dramatic uh, in Africa, both as a market and as an investment uh, uh, venue, uh, foreign capital. Uh, a lot of uh, activities around uh, the, uh, the um, uh, African Growth and Opportunities Act, which came into being about uh, during the Clinton administration and has been, uh, has been carried forward forward by both President Bush and President Obama uh, that has opened up some of the trade opportunities and dropped some of the tariff barriers. But just a number of things that are going on that the general public is not aware of that are quite exciting in Africa. Who, who, uh, what other countries? The United States. I'm, I'm glad he, he mentioned okay. uh, West Africa. Because if we take Benin, Togo, Ghana, uh, all these countries in the 70s and, and, and 80s, were ruled by mm. military dictators. Now they have been fully democratic mm -hmm. in the case of Ghana for, for fully 20 years. And there have been changes of government. In Benin, again there, it's a, a very democratic uh, a setup that, that exists right now. Uh, in Togo also, okay, some people would say, well, uh, Ayedema has had his son succeed him. But this time it was not through, it was through the ballot box and not through mm -hmm. the barrel of a gun. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. therefore, and there is lively uh, civil society and uh, vibrant uh, opposition parties. Well, therefore there has been a change for the yeah. Even where countries are not yet doing very well, those are changes some for positive the steps forward. Yeah. I, I'd like to add an element to that and Please. pick up on an earlier I point. Agree, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. But, but picking up on an earlier point you made about civil society. Yeah. One of the major changes in Africa, in my view, is exactly what the president said, the growth of civil society. Uh, and to me, uh, that's been ongoing for some time, but it particularly has emerged since the end of the Cold War. But what that means, besides the fact that you have uh, 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 groups of citizens who are, are understanding more fully their rights and demanding more expectations from their government, you also have them holding governments accountable as well. And okay. therefore, even in countries that we can't quite consider democratic successes yet, mm -hmm. uh, such as uh, Burundi uh, or, or Kenya, which has slipped back, uh, or a number of others we could name, uh, the, the, the societies are still fervent with pressure on government and, 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 and a, a, a tendency to move back towards a democratic mainstream. So even in though the, way the, that the structure hasn't changed, the, the expectations are changing yes. in a way that's pushing it toward a tipping point? That, e exactly. At least that's the optimistic. And, 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 and in a sense, it mirrors more what we... What what, what, what is our common uh, uh, vision of, of Western society? That is, governments may move left and right, they may stray from, but the citizens keep them on track. For, for the first time in, his, in, in post colonial history, you have that happening across the continent in Africa. And President Okai, before we uh, run out of time, I, I do want to ask you about a, an issue that you've been heavily involved in, which is uh, HIV AIDS. And, and give us the update on, on how we're doing in that regard. Well, the update is that basically all, all our governments in sub-Saharan Africa are doing something about HIV and AIDS. Southern Africa is the epicenter of the epidemic. The prevalence rates were very, very high and still are, are very, very high. And, and therefore, most of our governments in Southern and Eastern Africa, so far as treatment and care is concerned, 
they are more or less uh, managing it. We have largely converted what was a, a killer d disease into a chronic one. I lead a group of former presidents like me, and our duty is to encourage, to lobby our presidents to persist and persevere with the efforts against AIDS, especially at prevention. We want them to fight stigma, prevent mother-to-child transmission because it can be done. Many of the countries have reduced it dramatically. In my own country, we, we reduced it from an estimated 40% in, in 2000 to 4% by the time I retired in 2008. And I have just come from Zambia, where they have reduced it by 50%. Oh. And so I have said to them that this, we are saying to them, this, this can be done. So prevention of what sometimes is called mother to child transmission or vertical transmission. It should be a priority for, for our governments, and we are urging them that. Of course, we are saying that they must use uh, or follow or pursue evidence-based policies and practices. Uh, they must fight stigma. Um, and that the priority should be prevention. Uh, we remind them that in Abuja uh, and later also in SADC, they made uh, in 2000 and 2001, they made undertakings of no new infections by 2015. And that's what we are aiming at. That's great. And um, gentlemen, I'm sorry that our brief time together is over. This went so quickly. But I am glad that we did end on a, yes. a discussion point where leadership has made a difference mm -hmm. yes. in HIV AIDS prevention. Uh, President Mokai, Steve, thanks for joining us. Great pleasure. In addition to thanking our guests, I want to tell you that uh, we appreciate your watching and listening. And we'll return next week with another edition of Dialogue. Until then, for all of us at the Wilson Center, I'm John Molusky. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to hear from you. Please send your questions or comments to dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. You can also follow us on Facebook. Search Dialogue Radio and Television. Our host Twitter feed is twitter.com slash John Malevsky. Dialogue is a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Dialogue is available via broadcast, cable, satellite, and telco on MHZ Worldview throughout the United States. To see how to watch where you live, visit www.mhznetworks.org.